Overture in the French Manner by Johann Sebastian Bach, the opening work on tonight's concert by Glenn Gould. And now, in conversation with James Kent, here is Glenn Gould. Well, Jim, I see that the um, current trend in fan mags out Hollywood way is uh, to include the sort of interview where the interviewee, be they star or starlet, are subjected to a certain series of uh, identification association quiz tests, such as, Natalie Wood, if you were a platypus, what sort of platypus would that be, Natalie Wood? So, taking my cue from that, sir, I'd like to, to ask you to move in close, speak right into the microphone, speak to the friends out there in Radio Land, remove your dark glasses, if you will, uh, set aside the prepared dossier from your publicity rep full of stock answers and snappy retorts, and tell us just with which key, with which key signature, with which tonality, you, Jim Kent, most identify. G minor? G minor. It's a nice, moderate, balanced choice. Good relations, B flat major. You know, I played this game once over dinner with some friends, and um, there was a lady present whom I'd not met before, and uh, I thought I'd sized her up rather well. And so, toward the end of dinner, we began playing this game, and uh, she seemed, uh, you know, fairly direct, honest, straightforward, outgoing, uh, well brought up, and so I said, you're a C major person. And I tell you, there was sufficient umbrage taken uh, to, you know, leave me stuck with it for many years. It was incredible. She thought that she was an F-sharp major person. Of course, you can't be much farther from C major than that. She thought she was introverted, uh, inner-directed, uh, troubled, ambivalent. Uh, none of the things that the C major would suggest. And it really brought home to me that these funny old associations that composers had, that Scriabin had, and perhaps even Chopin had, with key and key signature, um, do mean something. I don't know quite what they mean. I'm not a believer in it, but I th I'm sufficiently open to ask you what it does mean. Or what uh, key uh, do you associate yourself with, Glenn? Hmm. I think I'm F minor, or perhaps B minor, one of the two. But today it's probably Today it's got to be B minor, because that's what this program is about, hasn't it? You know, um, we are doing something in this program which defies every law of good image, not to say program building, which is to create a program out of nothing but one key, or at any rate, keys closely thereunto derived. Is this another Glenn Gould postulate? <laughs> Or axiom. I am curious to see what will happen with this program, Jim, because um, there are certain laws of program building that people traditionally observe. The chronology law is one. You do not put Bach after Mahler. Unless it's an encore. True. There is the uh, law of dynamic curve. You end loud if possible, and if you end soft, it's got to be infinitely worldly wise and elongated. You can end with Das Lied van der Erde. You cannot end with the Walk to the Paradise Gardens. But the other great law of program building is that you must have key contrast. And it's always occurred to me that this presupposes that people really do have particular associations to make with keys. And uh, indeed they seem to, and composers seem to as well. But I don't quite know why, and I'm wondering whether you think there's any valid psychological reason for this. Well, I find that uh, the more one thinks about it, and the more one investigates it, the, the more complex it becomes. And in no time at all, you're dealing with uh, overtones and harmonics. And you eventually uh, seem to come, to come to the conclusion that uh, most of these things uh, cancel out. And that the essential thing, perhaps, is the personality of the composer. Mm -hmm. And that he uh, speaks to you, and whatever it is he uses, whatever language he has, it doesn't really make any difference what key he's working mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And yet, undeniably, the key of B minor, for instance, played a role for Bach. I don't quite know how great a role, because I haven't any statistics handy. But Bach does represent the democratization of the key and the key signature, wherever a composer did. He self-consciously wrote in every key to prove with an instrumental feat that it could be done, and there was no reason with improved technology why it shouldn't be done. Yet B minor is the key of the Mass. It's the key of Esses Genug from the St. John Passion. I think it's the key of Oh, Sacred Head Now Wounded from the St. Matthew. And of many other uh, statements which seem to wrap up his Christ love, you know. Um, C minor, similarly, for Beethoven, E flat major for Richard Strauss, the Eroica key, the Heldenleben key, God help us all, the Enoch Arden key. There does seem to be this peculiar sense of affinity for a certain mood establishing itself in a certain key. I mean, for instance, you know, it <clears throat> always occurred to me that if this democratization of the Bach key system is what it's cracked up to be, then technically one should be able to take any movement from any suite, transpose it to any other key in which another suite has been written, and have it fit without it seems showing. But um, I wonder if that's really so. I mean, can you take this and 
turn it into C minor and make this out of it. in that yes it doesn't seem to be nearly as brilliant in the C in minor? C minor really despite the fact that it's higher despite the fact it seems a little gloomier to me really than uh, than B, B minor B minor seems to me a uh, happier mm -hmm. more incisive uh, more aggressive uh, more outgoing uh, key than C minor do you have another example of, of this kind of transposition yeah let's try the Beethoven fifth symphony here first as it is supposed to be now let me put it in B minor. Did Beethoven know what he was doing? Well, I think if he were making a piano arrangement of it, he would put it in B minor. <laughs> I wish he had, having played the one that was made of it. <laughs> you pointed out something very interesting the other day, and that was that, of course, our whole notion of what C represents now is not the notion of what C represented 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is entirely invalid to say that a C major chord as belonging to a C major-like work is going to mean in basic pitch association for a listener today, or for us today, what it meant 200 years back. That is certainly true, and I began thinking about that and wondering whether it isn't possible to say that much of what we derive from key relates to what you could call certain primary experiences of keys as contained in national anthems, in hymns, in folk songs, in the primary listening experiences, if you can call them that. So I went through Groves the other day, and I'm happy to tell you that there are only two national anthems in the world which contain more than three flats or three sharps in their signature, those of Belarusia and Lithuania. And uh, think in terms of what that basic presupposition as to the texture of a key could do for Slavic gloom, as, you know, betrayed through the, uh, well, I don't know, the Belarusian tone poems, <laughs> which we're all so familiar. <laughs> Name one, please. But... Um, you know, if you think in terms of the fact that most people are familiar with national anthems that are in C major, or as in our case in G major, or F major for the, uh, uh, Canada, um, it does somehow suggest to me that that will grow on one, grow on all of us, as a primary reference. That will be something incredibly open, commonplace, and everyday and direct. And that as you proceed through the cycle of fifths, as you move from G major to D major to A major to E major, or conversely from C to F to B flat, B flat, you move away from that primary experience. And perhaps in the secondary, in the tertiary experience, there is a notion that somehow embedded in that experience is something anti-folk, something composer-directed, something infinitely tactily involved, you know? And that maybe that's why people like Scriabin and Chopin, who had very strong tactile senses, who were great instrumentalists as well as great composers, wanted to write in F-sharp major and an A-flat major, all those, you know, sort of dirty old man sexy keys. Um, I don't know, but that's, that's <laughs> the closest I can come to suggesting that maybe it doesn't matter that the overall pitch sense has changed, that A isn't A any longer, you know. Uh, no. Maybe it is a basic source of reference to what's being, being listened to in, in our society. I, I had a, a funny thing happen about um, a month ago, which really does bear on this in a strange way, bears on this whole idea of the public cognizance of key and key significance. Uh, I have a producer in New York um, at Columbia named Andy Kasdan. And Andy has always been very frustrated by the fact that he does not have perfect or, as it is sometimes known, absolute pitch. We got talking about this one day, and I said, well, you know, um, why? why? Why do you worry about it? He said, well, it, it, it's, I just feel unequal. I, I, I want to have perfect pitch. I feel I have a right to have perfect pitch. And I said, well, um, sing me the Star Spangled Banner. And he said, oh, sorry, I can. And of course, he was dead on, B flat major. And I said, now, the odds against your having done what you just did are 12 to 1. We talked a bit, talked about five minutes, and I said, um, sing me the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, Jose, you can. 
144 to 1. Went on about 10 minutes and talked some more about his grievances, and he then did it for the third time in a row, and I think I calculated the odds were 1,728 to 1 <laughs> that he could have done that. Now, I then said, well, this is fantastic. I have a feeling that you have undiscovered latent perfect pitch. Uh, sing me the last movement of the Beethoven ninth. Well, he was off by a fifth. Sing me the Brahms third. He was off by a fourth, and so on. He had perfect pitch for this one work, his national anthem, which he had heard at close of day after the late show and that morning setting up exercises on his TV every morning. For that, he had perfect pitch. And I think that in this way, you could indeed say that for G major, you know, all Englishmen will have the blood stirring and respond. For D flat major, they will regard the whole thing as a rather suspicious and, as I say, lascivious experience. I don't know. Have you thought of the effect that each composer has upon the, the use of minor or major. What I'm getting at is that uh, in, uh, say, the Violin Concerto of Mendelssohn, which is in uh, E minor, mm -hmm. you have uh, an almost a jubilant mood. You could hardly call it brooding. And yet, the Brahms Violin Concerto in D major mm -hmm. is uh, much more uh, it's tragic. Yes. That's very true. Now, what does this suggest, then, that perhaps it is not the key itself, but the utilization of the mm -hmm. triads mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the uh, related keys. That's very true. Have you thought that perhaps another aspect of our conditioning in relation to keys has to do with the fact that if we think in terms of B minor, for instance, as in the case of tonight's program, we are thinking of two things perhaps. I don't know. The, again, this whole area is new to me, and I think we're proceeding in a most gloriously unscientific way about it all. But it's due, first of all, to a conditioning of B minor per se, which is a two-sharp key, a relationship of D major, it is also due to a conditioning of the fundamental note B, which, in terms of our English national anthem reference, is a pretty sexy key, B major. Now, if you put this together, you get in B minor a kind of, um, what can I say, lofty directness. You, you get a confluence of, of two capabilities. One, the capability to be relatively fundamental and basic and world-concerned, as in D major, which is a simple two-sharp key. The other, a uh, much more complicated tendency to uh, introduce accidentals, to introduce enharmonic elements within the national experience. You put those two together, and you get a sort of uh, lofty, professorial, but national collective concern. Maybe that's why B minor is the key of the B minor mass, is the key of SSK, is the key of, you know, sort of worldview statements, for Bach at any rate. Yes, I don't know possible. that it was for, for Brahms, but I, I speculate that it could be as much an allegiance to principal tone phenomena as, as it could to, um, to the basic key or key signature itself. In yes, which case, the, it's a suggestion of modality, of, of pre-tonal memory. I mean, it's, a, it's a, uh, a Jungian thing, I suppose, really, in that case.
That's her whether he had a teacher before Schenberg. I don't know. I, I know there was much music in the family. Time. He had mm -hmm. uh, uh, one sister, I think, two brothers, or something mm -hmm. like that. The older one was named Charlie. C H A R L E Y. Charlie is an Austrian. Was his his elder brother, and his his elder brother was quite uh, interested in promoting uh, Alban's uh, mm -hmm. music. In fact, uh, he pointed out an advertisement in the paper of uh, Arnold Schenberg's uh, a teacher of composition. Mm -hmm. He showed this to Alban Berg. And, and he also uh, secretly took some of his compositions to uh, Arnold Schoenberg. Now, these would be compositions that predate the uh, sonata that I'm going to play. Yes, indeed, I think, because it was written during study with uh, Schoenberg. Mm -hmm. Is there any record of what Schoenberg thought of them, apart from the fact that he accepted them? He apparently liked them very much and uh, mm -hmm. wanted to take him on as a pupil. And I think he took him on uh, in about 1903 mm -hmm. and took him on gratis for three years until really? 1906. Mm -hmm. And they apparently got along extremely well. It's funny, you know, in the early things, I, I don't know the manuscript pieces that have been discovered of Berg, but the early songs and so on, the pre-Opus number songs, have all the trademarks of the later Berg, the Berg that became popular as a theater man, as an opera composer. Um, this sense of glorious ambivalence, which everyone loved him for, because Schoenberg, in his atonal manifestation, was not at all ambivalent. He was properly atonal, and that was that. Berg always had vestiges and wanted vestiges of some tonal memory to creep in. And of course, in the Sonata, you find this right at the death door of tonality, because it was about to collapse in any case with Schoenberg's almost contemporaneous work, the Opus 11 piano pieces. Berg's, how effective those cadences are. Right? Yeah, incredibly effective, because every other manifestation around them supplements and, and backs them up. Uh, or backs away from them, something to strengthen them, so that you get this glorious B minor cadence yes. at the opening. Yes, there's a tremendous plunge into despair. Yeah, and uh, it was indeed that sort of vestige which haunted Berg and haunted his music and haunts us through it, I think. Yes, you know, it, it was supposed to have been a three-movement work. Really? Yes, Berg had planned it that way. Did he write any part and of it? He complained uh, to uh, Schoenberg uh, that he had run out of inspiration. And so uh, Schoenberg uh, thought that he had said all that there mm -hmm. was to say, and, and mm -hmm. he said, why don't you leave it as a one-movement piece? A wise decision.
The Piano Sonata, Opus 1, by Alban Berg, ends this program by Glenn Gould. Earlier in the program, we heard the Overture in the French Manor by Johann Sebastian Bach, and the Intermezzo in B Minor, Opus 119, Number 1, by Brahms. <laughs>